This video is brought to you by my kind Patreon supporters and channel members. If you enjoy my content and seek to take your support a step further, you can freely join my Patreon or become a channel member with several added benefits. With that out of the way, enjoy today's content. When talking about Kaiser Wilhelm II's foreign policy, there is one topic that will almost always come up, and that is his relationship with the United Kingdom. From the German-British naval arms race to the Boers War, it is seen as Wilhelm's most catastrophic mistake in terms of foreign policy, that exactly this relationship paved the way for the First World War. And when I say that this argument is always used, I genuinely mean it. I have had several discussions over Wilhelm II over the years, and the previously mentioned topics would come up every single time, how the warmongering and idiotic Kaiser personally managed to deteriorate the relationship between the two great powers, that if he never did such a thing, the First World War would not even happen, or maybe go entirely differently. Which is exactly why this video is probably going to be the most important part of the series. Addressing and clarifying Anglo-German relations in that time is gonna clean up a good chunk of Wilhelm's image, and the rest should be relatively easy to do. But I won't just be clarifying and contextualizing the relations, rather I am going to take a bold step further by advocating the idea that it was Britain who was responsible for the deteriorating relations and not Wilhelm. I will be discussing three topics in this video, the Anglo-German naval arms race, his relationship with King Edward VII, and finally, how he in general aimed to work for peace with Britain. And I have to admit, the research for this video took a bit longer than I expected, because I also read through the sections on Anglo-German relations in my original Germany under Wilhelm II book from 1914. Yes, this is how much I am determined to get on with this series, by acquiring original literature from more than a hundred years ago. Without further ado, let's begin with our first topic. Almost everyone has heard of the Anglo-German naval arms race in the late 19th century, Wilhelm II building a giant navy to try and compete and challenge the British navy to show off his might, which in return takes a heavy toll on the German economy just because Wilhelm II wanted a bigger and shinier navy. Or at least, that's what the Brits say. Contrary to what the British claimed, Wilhelm was not inspired by a desire to challenge Britain's dominance of the seas, but rather to learn from Britain's naval history in developing his own fleet. During his childhood, Wilhelm would spend hours sketching the details of gun ports and rigging, and listening intently to the officers who took him on guided tours of ships. The young prince was so astonished at the power and beauty of the vessels that he dreamed of creating an impressive fleet of his own. And unsurprisingly, shortly after he ascended the throne, the Kaiser gave a two-hour lecture to the Reichstag on the necessity of improving the navy. But the arguments he used weren't that of sea dominance and dethroning the British Empire from ruling the waves. Rather, his reasons were more based on protecting German interests and expanding trade. A strong fleet would protect the German trade better and have the market reach more parts of the world as well as protect the trade routes from a possible blockade. Such actions required a strong fleet, especially now that Germany was one of the major European powers. But the Reichstag at first didn't share his views, since Germany was never really a naval power, but one man shared his ambitions, Admiral Alfred von Trippitz. He was staunchly in support of the Kaiser's plan of expanding the navy, arguing that sooner or later, Britain would become resentful of Germany's increasing success that war would be inevitable. He warned that the British would make use of their superior sea power by creating a naval blockade to starve Germany into submission, and the only means of preventing such a scenario was for the German Imperial Navy to become powerful enough to protect her harbors and seaways. Due to his, ahem, accurate predictions, Trippitz was viewed as an anglophobe and warmonger, but in fact, as one American commentator wrote in 1913, quote, He's a profound admirer of everything British, 
All his children have been educated in England. English naval traditions command his reverential respect. He has never ceased to hold them up to German sailormen as a model and inspiration. When he designed the naval law, he had little idea of entering the list with Britain as an active competitor." End quote. So there you really have it. Wilhelm II's and Tripet's two main goals with the navy were to expand trade and the German market, and for Germany to have the capabilities to defend herself in case of a naval blockade that could potentially hold all her trade around the world. These are perfectly reasonable reasons for a nation to want to build a naval fleet, and neither Wilhelm nor Trippitz held any grudges against Britain, and especially did not want to build a fleet just for spite and to challenge British dominance over the seas. By 1900, the German navy had practically doubled, making it a force to be reckoned with, and just like with the army, Wilhelm repeatedly stressed that the navy's sole purpose was to protect Germany's trading interests and to quote, secure us peace on the seas. And ironically, the British initially paid little attention to his plans, but as Germany's trade became stronger around the world, they began to view the growing fleet with mounting unease, and they were convinced that the Kaiser was intending to set up his fleet as a rival to their own. The funny thing is, the British never saw the navy as a threat to their naval dominance, but rather their economic dominance. The new German Imperial Navy enabled Wilhelm to find more commercial outlets and eventually outstrip Britain as the workshop of the world. But he did not deliberately attempt to undermine the British economy, for his focus was more fixed on expanding Germany's trade. He believed war to be bad for business and trade, and at the opening of the Kiel Canal, when ships of every nation were invited to pass through the waterway, he stated sincerely, quote, Only in peace can the world's trade be developed. In peace only can it prosper. We desire to maintain that peace and will do so. End quote. German manufacturing and trade was so successful that the British government ordered imports to be labeled with made in Germany, in hopes that people would boycott it. So in the end, the British were more concerned with Germany's trade dominance thanks to the navy, and not by the military threat they faced. With this, I would like to present an interesting thing that happened in 1907 during the Second Hague Conference. At the conference, Former British Prime Minister Arthur Balfour jokingly said that the British were fools not to find a reason to go to war with Germany before she took away British trade. When an American diplomat protested at this quote-unquote joke, Balfour simply replied that it would be simpler to have a war, and that it was not a question of right or wrong, but rather simply quote, a question of keeping our supremacy. Due to Germany's great economic successes with trade and the navy, there was an intense bitterness in Britain, and British author H.G. Wells would write, quote, We in Britain are intensely jealous of Germany, not only because the Germans outnumber us and have a much larger and more diversified country than ours, and lie in the very heart and body of Europe, but because they have had the energy and humility to develop a splendid system of national education, to toil at science and art and literature, to develop social organization, to master and better our methods of business and industry, and to clamber above us in the scale of civilization. This has humiliated and irritated rather than chastened us." End quote. And later on with the expansion of German dreadnoughts, shortly after the British launched its first version, the Kaiser was therefore blamed for precipitating the naval race, but he firmly believed that the British fears of his success were based on paranoia. Even at the absolute height of German naval expansion, there were over twice as many naval personnel in England as in Germany. The damage to his reputation had already been done and the tax increased as his naval expansion was taken as evidence of his belligerent intentions. In 1912, Winston Churchill gave a speech to the House of Commons, where he claimed that the only thing defending Britain was its navy. Quote, We are an unarmed people. We cannot menace the independence or the vital interests of any continental state. 
We cannot invade any continental state. When we consider our naval strength, we are not thinking of our commerce, but of our freedom. We are not thinking of our trade, but of our lives." End quote. This was a disingenuous statement, designed to frighten people into believing that the Kaiser's Germany posed a direct threat to their lives and freedom. And this is where we get the modern interpretation of the arms race. The British made it look like Wilhelm was out to get them with a powerful navy, when in reality, he never had plans of using the navy in offensive purposes, but rather maintained it to defend Germany's merchant fleet. While Queen Victoria was still alive, Wilhelm had every reason to hope for good relations between Britain and Germany. The Queen cared much about her grandson, and often spoke of her affection for Germany in much the same way as Wilhelm expressed his love for England. For a man who believed that monarchs had been divinely appointed, the strength of family ties was all that was necessary to maintain peace. In 1901, however, all of that would quickly change when Edward VII ascended the throne, who was Wilhelm's uncle. Throughout his nine-year reign, Anglo-German relations rapidly deteriorated. So what caused these relations to suddenly deteriorate just because Edward came to power? If we compare Wilhelm and Edward in terms of their lifestyle and sense of duty, we would quickly come to the conclusion that these men could not have been more dissimilar. Edward viewed his nephew as too erratic to be relied upon, while Wilhelm saw his uncle as dishonest and lacking in moral calibre. And he was not the only one who doubted his trustworthiness. His own mother, Queen Victoria, also did not fully trust him. During his childhood and youth, Edward caused his mother and father endless disappointments, showing how he was more interested in pleasure and clothes. For example, when he was posted to Ireland with a regiment of guards, instead of focusing on his duty, he instead had an affair with an actress. This shocked both his father and mother so much that Queen Victoria herself believed it contributed to her husband's early death. Queen Victoria had so little faith in her son that she refused to allow him to assist in her duties, and despite being the heir to the throne, she insisted that he be kept ignorant of sensitive information because she did not trust him enough. If all of this was not bad enough, Edward was also renowned for his fondness of gambling, and his name had been tarnished by several scandals. The two most prominent scandals he involved himself in were the Mordaunt case, where the wife of a member of parliament was pregnant and claimed Edward was the father, and the Tranby Croft affair, a huge gambling scandal involving him, which resulted in a court case. To Wilhelm II, his uncle remained the epitome of everything he despised, and it's no wonder why the two of them did not get along well. Just like Queen Victoria, Wilhelm did not trust the cronies with whom Edward surrounded himself with, particularly when Wilhelm amassed debts which ambitious financiers were happy to settle in return for his friendship. In Wilhelm's eyes, by allowing himself to become beholden to these unscrupulous bankers who placed their own agendas and ambitions above the good of the country, Edward was jeopardizing international relations. Wilhelm was not the only one to observe the danger of such friendships. One of Edward's former mistresses, Lady Warwick, recounted the case of Baron Hirsch, who had, quote, amassed a vast fortune by curious and unclean methods. I cannot help thinking that the Baron put King Edward VII under certain obligations, and it was characteristic of him that he never forgot those who served him. The Kaiser chaffled at his uncle's association with a mushroom financier, whose record was only too well known." End quote. It was even rumored once that when Wilhelm was visiting Windsor, Edward was so incensed by a comment that Wilhelm made that he actually struck him. Now, in all fairness, there is no evidence that this ever actually happened. 
but the fact that the story was so widely circulated demonstrates that their hatred for one another was common knowledge. Personal animosity aside, Wilhelm soon had a far more serious reason to mistrust his uncle. Within four years of his accession, Britain had formed an alliance with her own long-standing rival and Germany's arch-enemy, France. The Entente Cordiale took the Kaiser by surprise, for throughout the 19th century, British politicians had been so sure of the strength of the Empire that they had shown a disinterest in alliances and European affairs. Ever since the start of his reign, Edward VII tried his best to isolate Germany as best as possible. In 1903, he embarked on a tour of Europe, the true purpose of which was exactly that. During his visit to Austria-Hungary, Edward tried to persuade Emperor Franz Josef of abandoning Germany in favor of the Entente, and as Ottokar von Zanen wrote, quote, It is well known that Edward VII made an attempt to exercise a direct influence on the Emperor Franz Josef to entice him to secede from the alliances and join the powers encircling Germany. It is likewise known that the Emperor rejected the proposal. End quote. Unlike his mother, whose devotion to Germany was second only to her love for England, Edward's natural inclinations drew him towards France, a country with which he became enamored with during his first visit to Paris at the age of 14. And conveniently, the Entente Cordiale was formed a year after Edward's European tour. Wilhelm's eldest son, Crown Prince Wilhelm, observed that, quote, it was his personality which drew France into the Entente Cordiale with England, and it was he who attracted the Tsar further and further away from Germany and won him for England. Why do all that? To destroy Germany? Certainly not. But he and his country realized that for some years, the curve of Germany's commercial, economic, political situation and industrial progress had been such that England was in danger of being outstripped. Here he had to step in." End quote. It's already aware that Edward's personal disdain for Wilhelm paved the way for the Entente Cordiale, all in an attempt to isolate Germany. But it's not entirely clear as to exactly why he hated Wilhelm. It's very likely that it was jealousy. When Wilhelm was still in his twenties, he was free to discuss international relations with Queen Victoria, while he was refused any meaningful role in affairs of state. As the diplomat Alfred Kitterlen Wächter stated, quote, The Prince of Wales cannot forgive his nephew, 18 years younger than himself, for making a more brilliant career than has fallen to his lot. End quote. In 1894, Nicholas II ascended the throne of the Russian Empire. Since Nicholas was a distant cousin to Wilhelm, the Kaiser wanted to develop their friendship and to use their family ties to secure great cooperation between their nations. Over the next two decades, the Kaiser and Tsar managed to form a good bond and friendship, and they regularly stayed in contact by writing letters to each other. While they frequently discussed matters of international importance, they were also filled with affectionate messages for each other's families, and they usually concluded with, like, ever your affectionate friend Nikki or your devoted cousin and friend Wilhelm. But no matter how much Wilhelm strengthened his bond with Nicholas, there was one thing holding back a new Russo-German alliance. The fact that the German and Russian governments absolutely despised one another. As the Belgian ambassador in Paris one time noted, quote, Relations between the rulers have always been better than those between the nations and even between the two governments. End quote. In order to fulfill his grandfather's dying request and to prevent the encirclement of Germany, Wilhelm eagerly pursued the possibility of an official alliance with Russia, and he had every reason to believe that Nicholas shared his enthusiasm. But this would unfortunately never come to be, because Nicholas was hindered by two people, his cousin, Grand Duke Nikolai Nikolaevich, and his mother, Dowager Empress Marie Feodorovna, who were fanatic Germanophobes. 
Nikolaevich was soon to be appointed commander of the Russian armed forces and was so popular that it was almost impossible to oppose him and his mother, being of Danish origin, absolutely abhorred Germany due to the seizure of Schleswig-Holstein. In 1905, Wilhelm and Nicholas met aboard Wilhelm's yacht in the Baltic Sea, and it was on this yacht that the two emperors would sign the Treaty of Björko, a mutual defense agreement between Germany and Russia. But there was one little issue. The two monarchs never consulted their ministers and government, and considering how much those two hated each other, the agreement could never be ratified, and Nicholas's ministers were absolutely horrified when they found out. And, well, try to guess which man was not having any of this. Not long after the failure of his efforts to broker a treaty with Russia, he was informed that Russia and Britain were involved in the talks of a potential alliance, and with Russian officers attending British military maneuvers, this all seemed too likely, as Wilhelm would write, quote, The Triple Entente is being talked of by the whole world as an accomplished fact. English and French papers miss no opportunity of representing this alleged Triple Entente as being directed against Germany, and only too often the Russian press chimes in joining the chorus. End quote. Eventually, his fears turned out to be correct with Russia officially joining the Triple Entente. Wilhelm knew that his uncle was behind this arrangement, and even dubbed him as Satan, because he knew the sole purpose of this alliance was the isolation and encirclement of Germany. And it wasn't just him who knew this, many independent commentators shared his opinion. Quote, it can readily be seen what Russia can gain by the friendship with England, but it is much less clear what good the Russian friendship could do England. What else can they aim at in London if not making enemies of Germany?" End quote. Despite all of this, Wilhelm continued to try and improve relations with Britain, and even during the construction of the Baghdad Berlin Railway, when the British feared that it might impact their interests in Egypt and Persia, Wilhelm still tried to appease them by offering the railway to be a joint German-British venture. Due to Edward VII continuously worsening German relations and trying to isolate Germany, the Kaiser wrote, quote, I strive with all my power to improve our relations, and in spite of all this, you persist in viewing me as your arch-enemy. End quote. There was a glimmer of hope, however. In 1909, Edward paid a formal visit to Berlin. Wilhelm desperately hoped that this show of friendship might silence the press once and for all, and made sure to arrange everything as best as he could. And when everything was prepared, Wilhelm waited with his family at the station for his uncle's train to arrive. But Edward definitely aware of the protocol, switched to his wife's carriage at the last moment, leaving Wilhelm and his family to dash and run towards the other side of the platform. The visit in the end was not really successful, as over the next three days there was constant tension between the two monarchs, and despite Wilhelm's efforts to do all he could to make the visit a success, he was obviously very uncomfortable around his uncle, and as one observer noted, quote, To my mind, the effect of this visit was nil, and the whole atmosphere when the two were together seemed charged with dangerous electricity. End quote. On the 6th of May, 1910, Edward VII succumbed to bronchitis and passed away. Wilhelm was one of the ten reigning monarchs to attend his funeral, riding beside his cousin the new king, George V, immediately behind the coffin. But still, the Kaiser and his people still believed that Edward had been responsible for the damage done to Anglo-German relations. Even neutral diplomats viewed the king's influence as dangerous, because they thought that the peace in Europe was never in danger until Edward concerned himself with maintaining it. Even British peer Lord Suffield wrote, quote, Kaiser Wilhelm is, and always has been, 
very fond of England and the English, in spite of all that people may say to the contrary. He has invariably worked for peace with England. But in spite of all his really earned endeavors and his sincere love of this country, there has always been friction between the two courts. It is certainly not the Emperor's fault." End quote. So why did I dub this video as the most important in this entire series? Because this is widely seen as Wilhelm's biggest mess-up, that his foreign policy made Britain and Russia form the Triple Alliance in order to protect themselves, and it was the consequence of this which inevitably led to the Great War. And Wilhelm is seen as the one setting up the dominoes to fall due to his quote-unquote catastrophic foreign policy. But as I have demonstrated, it was actually the complete opposite. Edward VII pursued his goal of completely isolating Germany, not because Wilhelm was this bloodthirsty megalomaniac who was out for blood, but because he held a personal grudge against him and wanted to curb Germany's power as much as possible due to fears of Germany one day overtaking English economic dominance. The only thing Wilhelm really did which upset the British was the naval buildup, but even that I have shown to be completely false, since he never wanted to challenge Britain's naval dominance. But one could still say, why didn't he just submit and stop with it? I have a better one for you. Why did Britain overreact here just because another nation wanted to expand their navy and trade power? Why is Wilhelm to blame here? Why isn't Britain to blame for escalating the tensions? And if one uses the argument of defending their national interests, then so did Wilhelm here. He also defended Germany's national interests. But when Britain does it, it's seen as okay? Seriously? Why is Wilhelm to blame here for setting up the dominoes for World War I and not Edward, who had a clear motive and personal hatred to isolate Germany as much as possible? Why isn't he to blame for setting up the dominoes, but Wilhelm is? Wilhelm's whole foreign policy is demonized all the time, but in reality it was Britain who kept escalating and worsening the relations. But there is no mention of that anywhere. No, the innocent British Empire was just a victim here trying to defend herself from a bloodthirsty German monster. This is the narrative always shown, and suddenly, the British turn out to be the victims, instead of being the ones who escalated the tensions, if not were the ones who actually caused World War I and all that led up to it. But as it is always said, the victors are the ones who write history, and there is no clearer example of that than here. Despite Wilhelm's attempts to appease the British to lessen the tensions, in the end, he was seen as the one who caused World War I due to his foreign policy. And it is finally time to put an end to that myth once and for all. Join me next time, where I will be discussing Wilhelm II's efforts to prevent the First World War in 1914.